My name is John Piper, and I'm here with Rick Warren in the studios at Saddleback Church here in Southern California. And this is a finishing of something we started last That's exactly fall right. when we didn't get it's to do it. It's a promise our, that we made. Yeah. And yeah. thanks for fulfilling the Amen. promise. It's a sure. really great honor to do this here. And so let me set it up because I've got a, a way I want to do this. Okay. And you don't even know yet how, no. how we're doing it, but you've agreed to do it. I, I, I want to focus, Rick, on doctrine. I Fine. want to focus on the purpose-driven life. Every, okay. Everything I have to ask comes, the, all these pages here are from the purpose-driven life. I read it with a, <laughs> a fine-tooth comb, all right. and all right. I, I don't know how often you are seriously and appreciatively interviewed yeah. concerning doctrine. Not very often. You're known for a, yeah. a lot of other things, and, yeah. and so what I wanted to set it up is to say that I value mm. the other things that you're committed to mm -hmm. besides biblical doctrine, mm -hmm. and it's for the sake of those things that I care about foundations. Well, and I, I get interviewed on that stuff all the time. Yeah, and so you've said things like, uh, not right wing, not left wing, the whole bird. I, yeah, I, right. I like <laughs> knocking down stereotypes yeah. of evangelicals on social issues. Yeah. and. It, it seems to me that if, if I care and you care that what you're standing for at that level is there with a Christ-exalting core in a hundred years, mm -hmm. the foundations better be good. Mm -hmm. That's, That's what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about foundations. So, good. But let me mention the peace plan. Pursuing reconciliation, mm -hmm. equipping servant leaders, assisting the poor, caring for the sick, educating the next generation. Mm -hmm. Now. What I want to say is, who could not love those five commitments? <laughs> and therefore, uh, doctrine in my mind is not a distraction from or in competition with those kinds of foundation. commitments, but foundation. Actually, it's the driver. Yes. And, and the purpose-driven life, here's one more agenda that I have, mm -hmm. besides strengthening foundations and, or making them explicit. Sure. Um, I, I've read The Purpose Driven Life very carefully. This is 20 pages of notes here. Wow. Um, and I have read critiques of it. Mm -hmm. And one of my agendas is to do an appreciative critique. And, mm. and it will, I think, feel to you, okay. I hope it does, mainly appreciative. <laughs> because, yeah. frankly, I'm appalled mm. at the kinds of slanders mm -hmm that have been brought against this book mm. by people whose methods of critique, if they were consistently applied to the Bible, mm -hmm. would undo it as the Word of God. Mm. I, I really, you know, I, I, I'm one of these reformed types, mm -hmm. and my type tends to get on your case mm. pretty often. And when I read the book, I thought, what the issue here? So, 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 I, so I want to, to get you, I want to just get you talking Good. about things that are there Good. that are, I think, really uh, significant. Okay. So I'm going to do a bunch of quoting from the book, That's and fine. then I'm going to pitch you the ball and let you fine. talk a little more about it. So let's start where the book starts and where I love to start, namely the glory the of glory God. The glory of God. That's exactly Page right. Page 17. It's not about you. Mm -hmm. If you want to know why you were placed on the planet, you must begin with God. Page 53, the ultimate goal of the universe is to show the glory of God. Page 53, later on, what is the glory of God? It is who God is. It is the essence of his nature, the weight of his importance, the radiance of his splendor, the demonstration of his power, the atmosphere of his presence. Page 54, we are commanded to recognize his glory, honor his glory, declare his glory, praise his glory, reflect his glory, and live for his glory. Page 268, our goal is to make God look good in the universe. Page 101, Heartless praise is not praise at all. It is worthless, an insult to God. So there's a sampling mm -hmm. that makes my spine tingle with <laughs> gladness. Okay? Now, here, here's a few questions. Okay. Where did this focus come from? Um, or mm -hmm. any special influences? Or since we talked about this two years ago at yeah. Ralph Winter's funeral, any influence from Jonathan Edwards? Well, just ho however, the yeah. roots of it all. Sure. 
<laughs> well, definitely uh, Edwards is an influence. Uh, Edwards is without a doubt the most brilliant mind America ever produced. I'm not talking about theologian. I'm talking about mind and everybody. I put him above Einstein and everybody else. Um, I think you have talked it, uh, you know, it, it is passionate, enlightened intellect. It, and he used his mind. I have read through the complete set of, of Jonathan Edwards, which was about, I don't know, 22 volumes, and they're about eight, 800 pages each. Uh, he clearly was an influence on me. Um, but I, I think actually out of my Baptist background is I have read, uh, you know, my father was a Baptist pastor. My grandfather, my great-grandfather, I think I've told you before, was led to Christ by Charles Spurgeon and sent to America uh, as a church planter. And so uh, I still have books from four generations. I actually preached on this this morning about the multi-generational blessing of having grandfathers and great-grandfathers pray for you before you're even born. And I know I'm floating on the benefit of other people. I do not deserve the blessing I've got. And I was talking today about starting that legacy. Maybe your parents weren't Christians and, and moving into that. But it's very clear that the heavens declare the glory of God. Yeah. Uh, we learn a lot about the glory of God without even scriptures. I mean, we know God is organized. We know God likes variety. We know God is powerful and all these things. So the heavens declare the glory of God. But uh, I, I will tell you this. I know I've taken some shots from John MacArthur on this, but I will tell you that his book many years ago, mm -hmm. uh, when I was a teenager, he talked about, he's got a chapter in one of his books on the 17 uh, ways we bring glory to God. Mm -hmm. I've never forgotten that. In fact, I've preached that message mm -hmm. uh, in which he talks about this is brings glory to God, even your sanctification. And all of those ways, in, in, in bearing much fruit, we bring glory to God. And, all, and I've taught that myself for many years. When I was in high school, I wrote a message. It was a two-hour message, and I taught it all over California on uh, what it means to bring glory to God. Mm -hmm. So it, it's been in my heart, really, from, from uh, a teenager year. One of the connotations of, of kavod, the, the Hebrew glory, yeah. is weight. Right. David Wells laments right. that the reality of God lies lightly mm -hmm. on the American church. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd like to know if you agree with that. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you avoid fostering an atmosphere of, of trifling or flippancy or breezy superficiality when it comes to the, the weight of God or the weight of the glory of God? Well, in the first place, I think it goes back to my hermeneutic is when I see um, uh, verses in Scripture that tend to are apparent contradictions. I don't believe they are contradictions. Mm -hmm. I believe them both. Mm -hmm. I believe them both. I believe, take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. And I believe, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. They are different sides of the same thing. Mm -hmm. And I believe that the, the weight of glory is an, a serious, uh, you know, the, the, uh, what I call the wo go text of, you know, I saw the Lord seated on his throne, mm -hmm. and woe is me, for I'm a man of unclean lips. Uh, lo, an angel touched my name, and then go, the word of cleansing, the word of confession, cleansing, and commission. I believe that's part of the glory of God. I also believe what Irenaeus said, the glory of God is a human being fully alive. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. when I am playing with my grandchildren, that brings glory to God. So I don't think that glory to God is simply serious. Mm -hmm. I do think mm -hmm. that there's glory of God in laughter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I believe it all. And, and yeah, when I look it. at opposite passages, I believe them both. This is a very theocentric emphasis here, mm -hmm. as opposed to say Christocentric. Right. So my right. question is, right. w would you, um, I asked this question because it was asked to me at the, uh, at the Gospel Coalition yeah. on a panel the other night. Sure. They said, they said, has your God-centered message become uh, more or less Christocentric or mm -hmm. Christ-oriented? And I, I told mm -hmm. the story mm -hmm. of how in the last 10 years or so, um, I have felt impulses in me, partly mm -hmm. because of what I've seen in Scripture as, as the, the cross being the central uh, of everything, mm -hmm. and partly because of the Islamic influence in the right. world where exactly. God talk Exactly. God talk doesn't cut it anymore. Right. It doesn't. Christ talk is, is crucial. So my, my question is, any, if you wrote it today, yeah. would it be the same? Or oh, no. Do you, do you find? No, absolutely not. In the first place, 
I never intended purpose-driven life to be read by unbelievers. I was okay. presuming that people already had a certain basis uh, of, of Scripture because I didn't actually write it as a book. I wrote it as the workbook for our 40 Days of Purpose, mm -hmm. which is our annual spiritual growth campaign, which is not an evangelistic campaign. It's a spiritual growth emphasis that we've done every year for 30 years. And so rather than writing the book and creating a campaign around it, I did it for the exact opposite. I was writing it for my people. It was only at the end that I thought, an unbeliever may need to may read this. I better throw something in here about salvation. And, and actually, if I had known how many unbelievers were going to read it, I would have explained salvation far much more in mm -hmm. detail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I really, I, I admit it was a cursory uh, expression of it. Yeah, yeah. Now, I believe in Christ dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. I believe that we are in Christ, we are hid with Christ in God, and we are sealed with the Holy Spirit. So in essence, for Satan to get at me, he's got to go through the Trinity. Mm -hmm. So I 100% agree with you that we have to be even more Christocentric because of the influence of Islam today. You know, I frequently speak to Muslim groups. Now, what do you expect a guy who's got the gifts of evangelism? Okay, I spend most of my time speaking to people who totally disagree with me. Mm -hmm. I speak to gays, I speak to atheists, I speak to seculars, I speak to Muslims, because I'm trying to build a bridge between mine heart and theirs so Jesus can walk across and they'll come mm -hmm. to know Christ. I think Muslims in many ways are often like the Corneliuses mm -hmm. of Scripture, who have a heart for God. They want to do the right thing, but a lot of times, it's, have you heard of Jesus? Mm -hmm. Have you heard of Jesus? And when people say, well, we worship the same God, well, I say, hold on just a minute. My God looks like Jesus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So if your God doesn't look like Jesus, we don't worship the same God. Sorry. I'm going to come back to, to religions and, and the yeah. centrality of Jesus in a minute, but staying close to the glory of God. Let me go to the next thing. I mean, sovereignty of God. Sure. Amazing statements here. I love them. <laughs> so let me celebrate for a minute. All right. All let right. me talk. Page 111, God is all-powerful. He is in control. Page 195, our hope is a certainty based on the truths that God is in complete control of our universe and that he loves us. Page 94, God uses everything for good in our lives. Mm -hmm. Page 193, God has a purpose behind every problem. Page 194, regardless of the cause, none of your problems could happen without God's permission. Mm -hmm. Everything that happens to a child of God is father filtered right. and he intends to use it for the good of uh, even even if if uh, even when Satan and others mean it for bad right. because God is sovereignly in control accidents are just incidents in mm -hmm. God's good plan mm -hmm. for you page 273 your weaknesses are not an accident, but deliberately allowed, mm -hmm. a very interesting phrase, mm -hmm. deliberately allowed mm -hmm. them in your life for the purpose of demonstrating his power through you. Two more. 195, there's a grand designer behind everything, God's plan for your life, all that happens to you, including your mistakes, your sins, right. and your hurts. Right. And 196, this promise is only for God's children. Mm -hmm. It is not for everyone. Right. All things work for bad for those living in opposition to God and insist on having their own way. Right. So, right. question. Yeah. How did you come <laughs> to <laughs> such a, I would call, high or strong yeah. view of God's purposeful sovereignty? Well, those again, statements would, a lot of people would uh, gag on those statements. Well, yeah, they do. Uh, they do. Uh, from, the, from the very beginning, I started preaching when I was 16 years old. So I began studying Scripture very seriously. I had done over a hundred revivals in Baptist churches before I was 20. So I'm studying the Scripture as, as a kid, and I'm noticing that Christians often want to excuse God from things God doesn't need excusing from. When he says, am I not responsible for the blind? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Am I not responsible? God assumes much more responsibility. We're mm -hmm. afraid to give him that responsibility. Mm -hmm. Now, my personal view on this is that Romans 8.28 makes no sense without Romans 8.29. Mm -hmm. For whom he did foreknow, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that we might become the firstborn among many brethren. To me predestination, now I know some people are going to disagree with this, but is as much about sanctification as it is about salvation. Mm -hmm. 
that we are predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. Mm -hmm. And what I found on this is that how does God make us like his son? How does he make us like Jesus? If that's God's number one purpose, to make us like Christ. Well, it's not like we're walking down the street one day and zap, we're zapped, and all of a sudden I no longer worry anymore, or I'm always patient mm -hmm. with everybody, I'm always Christ-like. There's no pill, there's no conference, there's no book that can, can do that kind of sanctification. I have found, both from Scripture and from experience, that God allows us in the exact opposite situation in order to teach us character. Mm -hmm. Now, what is Jesus Christ? Well, the fruit of the Spirit's a good example. Jesus is total love, total joy, total peace, total patience, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, self-control. How does God teach me love? By putting me around unlovely people. Mm -hmm. How does God teach me joy in the middle of grief? Mm -hmm. Not happiness, which is based on happenings and happenings. How does God teach me peace? Not when I'm out fishing and everything's going my way and it's nothing getting better than this, but in the middle of chaos. Mm -hmm. How does God teach me patience? By putting me in his waiting room and forcing right, me. Right. So the exact opposite caused me that those are part of the sovereignty of God too. Right. And you've, in, in that narration, you, you used two different kind of verbs. Mm -hmm. You said, put me. Yeah, put me. And you said, allowed me. Yeah. And, and you've, you've got, I can't believe these are accidental phrases. You, you, They're not. You took a long, They're deliberate. You took a long they time to write this book. You, yes. you said the phrase, your weaknesses are not an accident, but deliberately allowed. Now yes. here's my theological yes, take on that. that statement. You're not an open theist. You think I'm God knows the future. Obviously not. God knows the future. So not. he knows uh, that something bad is coming. Right. He could keep you from it. Yeah. yeah. And so what you mean by permit is he doesn't keep you from it. He doesn't keep he, you from it. He, he, he but lets I would you. go even further than that. I would say that God custom designed my weaknesses. Now, I'm not saying he's custom, that I'm not making God responsible for my sin. I do not believe God is responsible for my sin. Some people may, but I believe that my own weaknesses are father filtered. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. just as much as God touched Jacob's hip and he walked with a limp the rest of his life, that there I have certain emotional weaknesses that are there to right. keep me dependent upon right. God. Right. Right. They're right. governors. Now, let's take sins, because you said okay. there's a grand designer behind everything. Yeah. God's plan for your life and all that happens to you, including your mistakes, your sins. Now, yes. sins are somehow folded in to the plan. Of course they are, because he is sovereign. And, and the, the clearest way I can say it is when I'm teaching on abortion. And I will say it this way. There are accidental parents, but there are no accidental children. There are illegitimate parents, but there are no illegitimate children. You may not have planned your kid, but God did. Yeah. Okay, and I believe that with all yeah. of my heart. Even though it might have been fornication that brought the kid about. Read the genealogy of Jesus, and you have to see how the four women in that genealogy, God used their sin mm -hmm. for his glory. Right. So you meant it for evil, God meant it for good, could, could be written as a, as a big banner over over all, all the sins of our lives. Absolutely everything. So some, some, you might have meant it sinfully, they meant, exactly. but God is it. God meant it. Genesis 50-20 applies to every area of life. Yeah. How do you speak just into tragic sure. situations? You, you come into a situation where yeah. everybody who's read these things and takes them seriously, yeah, knows yeah. what you believe. You're yeah. walking into, well, you did it yesterday. Yeah. So maybe use yesterday for an example. You, wa sure. you walk into a, 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 heart, a heart attack yeah. or, or a stillbirth yeah. or something and mm -hmm. speak. How does the sovereignty of God inform the way you talk? Yeah. Well, before I get to the doctrinal part, I first start at the human part, which is simply sympathy, that I listen. My first word is not, God can bring good out of this. Yeah that I'm going to get them there. There's no doubt about it. That's where I'm going with it. But I don't start with that. I first with weep with those who weep, rejoice with those who rejoice, be sympathetic, show tenderness and brotherly kindness. All the scriptures that talk about sympathizing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I love the verse in Job where it says, a man deserves the devotion of his friends even when he forsakes the Almighty. Mm. Now what that verse means to me is, even when, if I were to say, you know, right now, I don't believe in God. 
I still need John Piper to be my friend mm -hmm. and say, I can believe God for you right now. Mm -hmm. I'm going to mm -hmm. hold mm -hmm. you up while you are ranting and railing, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and God can handle my ranting and railing because he certainly handled David's mm -hmm. and Job's and so many others. So my first reaction in a pastoral care is not to explain. Mm -hmm. And, and again, mm -hmm. I don't think the primary purpose of the Bible is to explain suffering. Mm -hmm. I never have because the, the actual explanations are often inadequate. Mm -hmm. I think that the primary purpose of Scripture is to say, I'm all you need in this suffering, mm -hmm. and I need comfort. God does not owe me an explanation for mm -hmm. what he does in my life. And if I'm looking for that to feel better about my suffering, I'm not going to get it. But when you say that, I think what you mean is, he doesn't need to give you detailed explanation about why this suffering at this moment, right. at this time, but, but right. you do have big explanations. Oh, of course I do. The, the big one of why they're... Of course Because you've just said he, he uses it for this and this and this. Well, I, I, I have two explanations. First, I have the explanation of sin. Mm -hmm. At the fact that in the fall, literally everything is broken. Yeah. Okay. Nothing on this planet works. Mm -hmm. Every body is broken. None of our bodies work perfectly. Every relationship is broken. The weather is broken. I don't have a problem with hurricanes. Nothing works on this planet. Mm -hmm. This is not earth. This is heaven. This is uh, not, not earth. I mean, or heaven. This is earth. Yeah. And that's why we are to pray, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Why? Because God's perfect will is done perfectly in heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I am to pray that done here. And, and so... I have the explanation of sin. Everything's broken, so I should not expect anything. No marriage is going to work. You put two sinners together, you're not going to have a perfect relationship. I have that, but I have even greater than that. I have the greater glory of God. The history is his story, that he is in charge, and ultimately he knows what he's doing. I can get the miniature explanations yeah. in heaven. Yeah, okay. W one more thing on, on the sovereignty of God because of this phrase. Um, this promise is only for God's children, right. uh, Romans 8, 28. It, right. is, it is not for everyone. All things work for bad for those who live in opposition. So I, I just jotted down here, what does that mean? What, what, is, what is the bad? And I assume you mean a person who just T t till the end of his days, he's resisting, and he, and he dies without Christ, without God. Well, the Bible makes real clear that, that I if I am not receptive to the grace of God, I'm headed for wrath. But more than, more than just hell and wrath, and obviously I do believe in hell. Jesus spoke more about hell than he did about heaven. I trust him as the authority, not you, me, or anybody else. And, and it, if hell is not real, then Jesus was a liar. Yeah. Okay, and God has a lot of explaining to do uh, on, on his justice and, and things like that. But uh, more than that, go back on that question. You read it again to me. Yeah. What does it mean that all things work for bad? Well, uh, they clearly aren't working for good because God owes me nothing. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to work anything for good in my life. That's only for those who are called according to his purpose. Right, right. Okay. So when, when the, the purpose-driven life... Um, written originally for believers, right. is rooted profoundly in 8.28, 29. That's totally based on, that's the, that is the central text, really, of the whole book. Yeah. Romans yeah. 8.28 yeah. and 29, for those he foreknew, he predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son. It's about becoming like Christ. Why, why do you think, mm -hmm. I mean, it, a book doesn't sell 40, 50, whatever, <laughs> million lot. copies, yeah. unless unbelievers are reading. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Um, and, and are they stumbling over a sentence like, things are going to go bad for us, if we don't get saved? Well, I think everybody does selective reading. Mm. Okay, I think believers, everybody has a filter. And that's why it's really easy for critics to see things from their perspective. Yeah. And then I'm going, well, I didn't mean that at all. Mm -hmm. and, and believers do the same. Uh, oh, believers. Here's a question that probably would trouble a lot of people about you. Sure. Trying to figure you out in public. Yeah. Larry King and yeah. uh, Steve Colburn or whatever his name yeah, is. Stephen uh, Colburn. Uh, Colbert, yeah, uh, right. Bear, Bear. Yeah. Um, do you do you hedge yeah. on the sovereignty of God when you're in that kind of setting? Well, I don't think so. I think if you go and look at those 
examples. Uh, Larry King uh, has asked me very pointedly, for instance, about homosexuality two or three times, and I make no bones about it. Mm -hmm. I said, no, there's a right and there's a wrong. And I said, you know, I said, Larry, let's don't even argue with this from Scripture. I said, take a human body, a male and a female. It's obvious certain parts are meant together, and there's a purpose and a design for mm -hmm. it, and there's a result of that. Mm -hmm. I rest my case. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to, I don't have to defend God. You know, it's like Spurgeon said with the scriptures. Now, I, what I do, would like to say, since you brought that up yep. about my public appearances, yep. everybody needs to understand there's one thing that motivates me. It is the global glory of God. I am first and foremost a missionary. Mm -hmm. I am an evangelist and I'm a missionary. So, for instance, when I have done political things, I couldn't care less about politics. I have zero interest in politics, really. And uh, they don't allure me. I have no interest in them, um, because if I believed that the law could change people's behavior, I'd become a politician. Okay, but only Christ can change the heart. So why do I accept Larry King and the inaugurations mm -hmm. of the last two presidents, things like that? Because I am trying to, it, it was actually for international consumption, not national. Mm -hmm. In the last uh, eight years, I've had almost 15,000 of my members overseas in this peace plan. Mm -hmm. And we were making a commitment to go to every nation, all 195 nations. So, I mean, I had people in Algeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Yemen, and many other places where it, they're, they're not well accepted. Mm -hmm. When I accepted the, the invitation to do the president's inauguration, who I clearly don't agree with, mm -hmm. uh, just like I would accept an invitation to Larry King or whatever. It's because I knew every, on that inauguration, every national leader, every king and prince around the world was watching that show. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I thought, if I have a team that's in a country and they get in trouble and they can hold up a picture, this is the president of the United States and this is my pastor, <laughs> it may be able to get them out. So it really had nothing to do with national consumption. Mm -hmm. My motivation is really all about mission. Yeah, yeah. Let me shift gears, not entirely yeah. from sovereignty of God, but sure. just to push it up a level sure. and ask a question about the election. Sure. Um, would I be right, here's my question, would I be right to infer from your biblical commitments that your view of God's sovereignty that you embrace the doctrine of unconditional election. Yes, I do. Of course I do. In other words, God can, yep. does, choose who will be saved right. before the foundation of the world. Mm -hmm. Would that be right? Yes. M my qualifier on that is, I say, if I find a verse that tends to say something else, a whosoever will may come, mm -hmm. I believe them both. Mm -hmm. I, I don't, my faith, my hermeneutics does not demand that I correlate every verse. I, in other words, uh, there are often verses that appear. I'm a John 3.16 mm -hmm. Christian. Mm -hmm. I believe God so loved the world. I do believe that. And I believe that whosoever believes in him shall not perish. But I also believed, you know, uh, predestined from the foundation of the earth. Mm -hmm. So to me, I don't, I'm able to hold tensions in my mind rather than having to explain them. Mm -hmm. And so I... To me, I, I don't I don't fit in a real good box, mm -hmm. in that I, I believe I believe in both. Yeah, and you wouldn't when you say you don't feel obliged to correlate them. Yeah. I, I, let me restate that and okay. see if you agree. You don't think that they ever contradict each other. I do not. I think any apparent contradiction in Scripture right. is my limited capacity. Yeah. Me trying to understand God is like an ant trying to understand the internet. Yeah, yeah. I don't have the brain capacity. Yeah, it seems to me that um, in the in the Arminian Calvinistic debates over uh -huh. the centuries, mm -hmm. um, Calvinists have spoken like you just did, mm -hmm. and Arminians tend to feel like they need to negate unconditional election. Hmm. Hmm. Is that true? I mean, you probably that that, that's, that's probably true. I mean, my, and I, 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 instead of saying, "Can I, can I see both, both and?" Right. In other words, there's two kinds of thinking. There is conjunctive thinking, and there's disjunctive thinking. Disjunctive thinking says it has to be either or. Now, clearly, there are some either ors about I'm yeah, either sure. trust Christ or I don't. Right. I'm either pregnant or I'm not. Right. Okay. 
But a lot of thinking in Scripture when it comes to theology is, in my opinion, conjunctive thinking. It's both and. Right. And, and my experience... I believe that, and I believe that. It is, and, and we're wired... Everybody's wired differently. Yeah, sure. My, when I see these two, yeah. I am pressed, if, if I can, and yeah. sometimes you can't, sure. to, to push them down until the root merges. Until you get to the root, sure. Yeah. Until the root merges, you can right. see... Well, the reason there's no, they, they look like they look whosoever like will right. may come is right. the absolute truth. Yes. And, and chosen before the foundation of the world is the absolute truth. Yeah. And, and you just, some are driven Keep, to, get them I down. think theology is an effort. That's why we need guys like you. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an interesting thing. Yeah. The importance of eternity yeah. in your book. Yeah. Uh, a few quotes. Uh, page nine. Um, this book, the most important, most important is to prepare you for eternity. Yeah. Verse 34, you weren't put on earth to be remembered. You were put here to prepare for eternity. Mm-hmm. Verse, uh, page, <laughs> verse, <Yeah. laughs> like, this is not the Bible. Yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> page 38, to, to make the most of your life, you must keep the vision of eternity continually in your mind and the value of it in your heart. Page 283, two more, telling others how they can have eternal life is the greatest thing you can do for them. Mm-hmm. And one more, 295, the eternal salvation of a single soul is more important than anything else you will ever achieve mm-hmm. in life. Um, so before, I mean, don't, don't just focus on uh, eternal salvation. It yeah. seems to me that You're saying for life to make sense, for life to be lived to its fullest, you need to keep eternity in view. Most Americans don't agree with that at all. Now, how do you, how do, first of all, how does that work for you? And then, and then to say to the world, you want the fullest life, keep eternity in view. Why? Well, I actually preached on that this morning where I was talking about the number one problem in our society today is short term thinking. The only thing that matters is here, and the only thing that matters is now, and America's inability to delay gratification because we do not have eternal thinking. To me, thinking with the uh, the mind of Christ means to be thinking in light of eternity, which is what Colossians is all about, okay? And that our lives are hid with Christ in God, and, 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 and that eternity, we're gonna spend far more time on the other side of death than this side. We get 80 years, maybe at the most 100, trillions of years in eternity. This life is preparation for the next. This is the warm-up back. This is the dress rehearsal. This is the get ready. This is the first lap around the track before the real race begins because it, it, it is in eternity. Now, the question people ask is, well, if we're going to go spend eternity, why do we do this little time here on earth first? Why didn't God just create us and take it directly to heaven? Well, there, first place, he wanted us to choose to love him. I believe that. Love is a choice. I believe that we love that if I'm forced to love you, then I don't know that I've really loved you. But what I'm saying is that God wants us to practice on earth what we're going to do forever in eternity. And what we're going to do in eternity is four things. The Bible's real clear about this. First, we're going to worship in eternity. Mm -hmm. We're going to worship in eternity. So what does God want me to do while we're here on earth? Practice. Mm -hmm. Practice worshiping. So so when I get there. Second, we're going to fellowship in eternity. We know that because that's always going to be there as believers. What does God want us to do here? Practice. Learning how to love, learning how to fellowship here. Third thing, we're going to serve in eternity. We're going to sit around on clouds. You know, this whole idea of, you know, heaven is uh, wear a white robe with angels and play a harp. To me, that would be hell. (laughs) I can't think of anything more boring. You know, a multicolored God who created this world is not going to put us in a white heaven. I guarantee you. Mm -hmm. Um, But we're going to serve him in heaven. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what does God want us to do? Practice. Okay, and we are actually going, I believe we're going to grow in heaven. I believe we're going to keep growing. The Bible says one day we shall see him as he is. We shall become like him. That's going to be obviously becoming not gods. Obviously, I don't believe that. That's the Mm -hmm. oldest lie in the scripture, Uh, but becoming godly. Mm -hmm. Okay, becoming like him. Actually, what we can't do in heaven is sin and witness. Mm -hmm. And obviously, God didn't leave us here to sin. So I've often said, why does God leave us here on earth once we accept Christ? Mm -hmm. Once once we're in the family, why didn't he just kill us? Mm -hmm. I mean, why leave us here? Well, because he's working on our character. Mm -hmm. 
through these trials, these tribulations, we're learning to practice what we're going to do in heaven. Mm -hmm. So really, the kingdom mindset is actually the eternal mindset. Yeah. Yeah. It's and not just about eternal life. Eternal life is, is getting ready for that. How do you conceive of eternity? Here, here's the specific question. Yeah. Um, heaven is usually used as the word where yeah. we're going yeah. and where we'll be. Mm -hmm. What's your understanding of the new heavens the new earth? Where do we wind up after the resurrection? You know, I, that's a good question. I do know, I do know I'm going to heaven. I have no idea about that. I have read all of the scriptures and the, the passages that define the paradise and, and, and you know, pars, pars mm -hmm. and things like that. To me, what matters is I'm going to be with Jesus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be in his presence. Mm -hmm. And I, my, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess. At that point, you know, uh, those on earth, some to judgment, some to mm -hmm. salvation. In other words, what I'm saying is that I, I think some people want every. I think one day Madonna is going to say Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one day Muhammad is going to say Jesus is Lord. Mm -hmm. Hitler will say Jesus is Lord. Right. But to me, heaven is a real place. I, I don't believe it's a state of being. I believe it is a real place, and I believe it is a place where we're going to do these things. There's a reuniting. Uh, there are certainly going to be rewards. The Bible makes that really clear that there are rewards in heaven. Um, I believe there is reassignment. Reassignment. In other words, faithful in little things, I will trust you in much. And if you have not been faithful with that which is not his own, who will give you your own? And if you've been unfaithful with unrighteous mammon, who's going to trust you the true riches of heaven? So, so are, are you saying that you kind of leave open whether we wind up on the new, new earth? I do. I do. I, I honestly haven't studied it. Okay. I, I have not studied it as deeply as as I should because, uh, you know, it's a trite to say that, you know, like on the second coming, I'm not on the time and place, I'm on the, on the welcome committee. Yeah. And, and really, I, I need to explain this to, to people who will watch this because I've taken some hits for some of the things I've said seem to devalue prophecy, mm -hmm. okay? And mm -hmm. I've taken a lot of criticism on that. And I make my statements on the basis of two statements of Jesus. First, Jesus says in Matthew 25, no man knows the day nor the hour, mm -hmm. neither the angels nor the Son, mm -hmm. but only the Father which is in heaven. Now, if Jesus didn't know when he's coming back, I'm, I'm crazy for me to try to think. Jesus himself in that scripture, only the Father which is in heaven. So you, you don't think that, say, the peace plan or the, the labors to, to make life better here is going to be a continuity of improvement that goes into a kingdom. Oh, I'm definitely not post-millennial. No, okay. and I do not believe in bringing in the kingdom uh, uh, by human means, and no sense of the matter. Mm -hmm. Now, I do believe that the kingdom of God is present wherever Jesus is king. Mm -hmm. That's my definition of the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. If Jesus is king in heaven, then the kingdom of God is in heaven. If Jesus is king on earth, uh, a, a reign on earth, then the kingdom of heaven is on earth. If Jesus is king in my heart, then the kingdom of God is, is in me. It's wherever Jesus mm -hmm. is king. Mm -hmm. So I don't kid myself. Jesus said, the poor you'll have with you always. Mm -hmm. So our efforts to help the poor does not mean we're going to eradicate poverty. So it, 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 the, way, the way you create an attractive heaven or future yeah. or eternity yeah. is by calling heaven a place because we're going to have new bodies. Absolutely. Right? Resurrected uh, bodies. Resurrected bodies. Yeah. Jesus ate fish yep. after he was resurrected. And walked resurrected. through walls. So you're just, you're, you're taking it at least that far. We're going to yeah. have resurrection bodies. Yeah. Um, lion will lay down with the lamb yep. Yep. means... Yep. Well, uh, you, 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 lion will lay down with the lamb. I don't have a problem with that. In I heaven. Could, yes. They go to heaven. Animals go to heaven. I, you know, I assume. I, I don't know. That's, that's one of the most questions I'm asked more often than anything else. Will my dog go to heaven? And I say, well, the lion will lay down on the lamb. Somewhere. <laughs> Somewhere. Okay. Somewhere. We'll yeah, leave it could it. be here on earth. We'll leave it. Okay. Let's go to the gospel. All this right. Is, this is the center. Mm -hmm. and, and even though you said yes. that you didn't um, write the book primarily for unbelievers right. and you would write it differently if you knew right. so many right. millions would read it. Oh, yes. Nevertheless, I want to argue that the gospel is here and I want to read it. All right. and, and, and then we'll talk a little bit about the, right. the nature of the gospel. Page 55. Uh, here, here, in order to have a gospel, we have to have some bad news to yeah, sure. be saved from. Sure. All sin at root is failing to give God glory. Right. It is loving anything else more than God. Right. I'm loving this. Okay? Idolatry. 
Yeah. Refusing to bring glory to God is prideful rebellion, and it is the sin mm-hmm. that caused Satan's fall and ours mm-hmm. too. Now, mm-hmm. what's the good news over against that mm-hmm. dreadful, sinful condition that we all bring? Uh, page 294, what is the good news? The good news shows how God makes people right with himself, that it begins and ends with faith. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. This is the wonderful message he has given us to tell others. The good news is that when we trust Christ's, when we trust God's grace to save us mm-hmm. through what Jesus did, right. our sins are forgiven. We get a purpose for living, and we are promised a future in heaven. Mm -hmm. When Jesus stretched his arms out wide on the cross, Mm -hmm. he was saying, I love you this much. Mm -hmm. Or page 112, if God never did anything else for you, he would still deserve your continual praise for the rest of your life because of what Jesus did for you on the cross. Mm -hmm. God's Son died for you. This is the greatest reason for worship. Or page 58. Mm -hmm. All you need to do is receive and believe. The Bible promises to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, mm-hmm. John 1, 12, he gave the right to become the children of God. Believe God has chosen you to have a relationship with Jesus who died on the cross for you. Mm-hmm. Receive Jesus into your life as mm-hmm. your Lord and Savior. Mm-hmm. Friendship with God is possible only because of the grace of God and the sacrifice of Jesus. Right. One more. Mm-hmm. The only thing that will matter at the judgment is, did you accept what Jesus did for you, and did you learn to love and trust him? The dearest thing to the heart of God is the death mm. of the Son of God. So mm. now, here I am. I'm rejoicing and exulting in mm-hmm. the orientation mm-hmm. of the gospel on the cross, right. on the death of Jesus. You say, what Jesus did right. for you. Now, right. I assume that when you say you would do something more, what, what here's the more I'd like to hear a little more about yeah, is yeah. you don't describe actually what happened when he died. I don't. And, and I don't. so talk. I just didn't to, explain justification. Uh, I, I didn't explain him who knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. That is salvation. I certainly believe in the imputed. Righteousness of God, not imparted, but imputed. No, no doubt about it. Yeah. That's so no, let's jump in right there, because one of my later pages was: yeah. Does it? Do you think it matters significantly mm-hmm. to to make that? Roman Catholics would tend to say yeah. um, that justification is the impartation right, of yeah. righteousness, and, and right. Protestants have historically said right. it's the imputation imputed. of alien righteousness. Exactly. And you've just said that exactly. matters. Oh, absolutely, it matters. It's it's absolutely significant. Uh, to the matters. What I would do differently was the prayer that I wrote in this thing, mm-hmm. because uh, I have taken shots where I said, now, because I, I, I felt like I explained the cross. I even do a chapter on Jesus' suffering in, in there. But when I come down, I said, believe and receive. And, and you say, I say, pray this prayer. Jesus, I believe in you and I receive you. Mm-hmm. Now, the basis of that prayer is simply John one twelve. Right. To them, you know, he gave the right to become the children of God, to those who believe on his name, who receive him. And people have uh, 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 attacked me saying, wait a minute, there's no word, the word repentance is not in that prayer. Do I believe in repentance? Of course I believe in repentance. Repentance is the basic message of the New Testament. Mm-hmm. Metanoia mm-hmm. is the message of every one of the apostles. And I could take you from M- M- Matthew to Revelation mm-hmm. and show you how every mm-hmm. single man mm-hmm. preached repentance. Right, right. Um, yeah, and, I, and I, I'm going to help you here. Cause okay. Don't... Uh, you, I, I was reading it with that criticism in mind. Yeah, yeah. So let me read a couple of things, and you pick sure, up where you want to sure. read repentance. Sure, okay, there, even though you 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 might say you, right. you'd say more, but right. it's not in the prayer. That's what they were looking for. Okay, okay. okay. So uh, at any rate, yeah. here's the way you say def- you define repentance: uh, to be like Christ, you must develop the mind of Christ. The New Testament calls the mental shift repentance, mm-hmm. which in Greek literally means to change your mind. To, to repent when, whenever you change the way you think by adopting how God thinks about yourself, about sin, about mm-hmm. God, mm-hmm. about other people, life, your future, everything else, you take on a Christ's outlook. Or one yeah. more, yeah. Um, offering yourself to God is what worship is all about. This 
act of personal surrender is called many things, consecration, making mm-hmm. Jesus your Lord, taking up your cross, denying yourself, yielding your spirit. So mm-hmm. what, what, what I wrote here is missing was mm-hmm. the quotations of repent, the verb repent. Exactly. It wasn't there. You, you, you know that Christ, the Christian life is yeah. one continual con- conformity of the mind. Right, right. Get it from this to this, turn, right. turn, turn, right, right. and repentance is everywhere in this book in that sense. Right. Yeah, and and uh, again, uh, the question I would ask the people, first place, I, some of the criticisms that people said, I happen to agree with. Yeah. And I, well, you could have said more in, in explaining justification. I, I agree with that, but I wasn't writing it for non-believers. I was writing it to my church, who I already knew uh, were, were there. Right. But when I got, when I thought, oh, I better throw in a little bit on salvation, mm-hmm. and it really mm-hmm. came back as an afterthought and mm-hmm. kind of tossed it in. But I would question this. Do you have to say certain words mm-hmm. in order to be saved? Because if you yeah, do, yeah. then the thief on the cross wasn't saved. Right. And I can give you a hundred other people in scriptures sure. because uh, the thief on the cross simply said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, today you'll be with me in paradise. Mm-hmm. Where's the repentance? Mm-hmm. He didn't ever say the word. And I could give you a hundred other examples mm-hmm. where Jesus says, believe in the Lord, or Paul, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. I wonder if the saved. root... I'm thinking of of my good friend and John MacArthur, whom I love and esteem and respect. Behind his question or or critique on that level might be, do you really believe that that in order to be saved, Mm -hmm. to be regenerate, Mm -hmm. there needs to be evidence of of a changed life? Of course. Absolutely. Uh, uh, You can't live like the devil. You can't believe, like easy believism. He wrote a whole book, The Gospel of Jesus. Exactly. What did you think of that book? I thought it was a great book. I thought it was a great book, yeah, too. Yeah. And, and it got him into big trouble because it looked like, you know, it was yeah. making uh, salvation depend on works. Yeah. When, in fact, it, it was saying, the I think, right. that the fruit yeah. of the new birth better be real. Yeah. You know, it's quite really funny because, for instance, Oz Guinness wrote another book about the megachurch called Dining with the Devil. And some people thought that Oz was actually writing about Saddleback. People didn't realize Oz was on my staff. Okay, and, and he wasn't talking about Saddleback. Mm-hmm. And one of the problems is when a church is large, it often gets lumped into other large churches. Mm-hmm. I could name some other well-known churches that we have nothing in common with, okay, in terms of our view of discipleship, mm-hmm. our mm-hmm. view of salvation. The only thing we have in common is we both happen to be big. Mm-hmm. And, and so... I would just say this is not your father's saddleback yeah, or yeah. this is not your father's megachurch. So yeah. Some of those things yeah. are different. It, but I, I do believe uh, in, uh, obviously, in fact, in, if you listen to my preaching seminar, I have a three-day preaching seminar, and I have an entire sentence on you're not preaching the gospel, uh, sermon session, on you're not preaching the gospel unless you're preaching repentance. In fact, it is the fundamental message of Christianity. It is the change. It is the metanoia. Now, here's what I disagree with with some people. Some people think repentance means change in behavior. And I tell you that that is the fruit of repentance, not the root. Yeah. There's not a single Greek lexicon yeah, yeah. that says repentance means change, yeah. stop doing bad. Bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Exactly. That's exactly what John the Baptist taught, and, and that's what all the others taught, too, in that repentance is the way I change my mind. It, the, the modern word for repentance is paradigm shift. Mm-hmm. I used to think this way about my sin. Now I think this way. But you wouldn't say, probably, I mean, can hear people over sure, my over, shoulder yeah, exactly. saying, you can have a wonderfully changed mind and everything stays the same in your life. Like, no, you're still sleeping not. with your girlfriend. No, no. You're and still stealing at the office. You're still reporting and late And that's for why work. the Bible says, by their fruit you shall know them. Yeah. But it is the fruit of repentance, not the root. Right. In other words, it is, it is not my behavioral change that saves me. Yeah. Yeah. It, that is the proof that I have been saved no doubt about it. And my change does come with, I see God differently. I see, and here's the interesting thing. For me, when I repented, it was not a negative. People ask like repent's a negative word. To me, it's the most positive word in the world. It's yeah, actually an yeah. act of joy. Yeah. I turned yeah, yeah. from darkness to light, yeah. from hopelessness to hope, yeah, yeah, yeah. from guilt to forgiveness, from m- m- me running my life to Christ running my life. So an implication, I think, would be that as you preach to professing believers, which right. I, I do every Sunday, sure. 
Um, I don't think I'm contradicting their security in mm -hmm. Christ. Their Romans 8.28, those who be justified, he glorified security mm -hmm. by warning them if they continue in such and such, or if they do this, they won't enter the kingdom of heaven. This goes back to where, of course not, okay. not at all. Of course, in fact, again, I, I, I believe, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. You know, it's not of works, as no man should both. And I also believe, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Right. I have no problem with both of those verses. Right, right. I have no problem. Yeah, okay, well, I hope that helps some folks, yeah. because I saw that here. Just a few more on the gospel. Do, do you think that, and, and maybe this has already been answered, justification, justification by grace alone, yeah. through faith alone, yeah. because of Christ alone, to yeah. the glory of God alone, the solas. Yes, the solas. That that's a good, solid summary of, of the gospel. I believe in the five solas. Yeah. 100% believe in the five solas. Right. Okay. And, and, and I am, uh, to those of you who know what this I'm a monergist. I don't call myself a Calvinist. I don't. I have to say that. I don't call myself, but I am a monergist. Mm -hmm. In that I believe that it is not of my works. It is, it's, it's one-sided. Right, right. Mm -hmm. when you, do you dislike the name Calvinism mm -hmm. because of key doctrines that are wrong or because of connotations it would carry? Only or the it, connotations. Okay. Only the, and I, I say this in true love, but I wish that those who believe in the doctrines of grace would be more gracious. Yeah. Yeah. That's all I'd say. So you, you don't have a problem saying, I embrace the doctrines of grace, but I'd really not be connected with some people who... You know, I, and again, I don't call myself, you know, I'm, I, my Baptist is, background is Baptist, and I'm proud of that, but mm -hmm. I don't go around calling myself a Baptist mm -hmm. all the time either. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a John 3.16 Christian, I'm an evangelical, uh, you know, I believe the doctrines of grace. And justification, we've touched on. Yeah. Uh, imputation matters to Absolutely. It's right it at the core of the Absolutely. gospel. Absolutely. It is the core of the gospel. So you don't... You, you, Him if, who if, knew no sin became sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of yeah, God. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.19 is yeah. right, right, right at the core. And yeah. I, I just want to underline it because today, mm -hmm. uh, I think even in evangelicalism... Um, there's wishy-washy on that. Well, there's not only wishy-washy. Yeah. It's just said it's not in the Bible. Yeah. That that imputation is not there. Yeah. And I could name names of yeah. people you, you know, know and I know yeah, that, right. that are breaking my heart yeah. that they have departed from what we always thought was historic Protestant Christian and biblical, biblical, biblical exactly. teaching to right. say what you need is forgiveness of sins and for the imputation of your sins to go onto Jesus. Yeah. You don't need the imputation of his righteousness to go yes. onto you. yes. Yeah, and I will say this: there obviously there are, there have been historically many different theories of the atonement, and I think each of them has a part. But I think fundamentally it is the substitutionary understanding that God, Jesus, took our payment, and you can't understand. Yes, He did defeat the works of the devil. Oh, yes, he is an example of love mm -hmm. and sacrifice. And I believe all of these are pictures, mm -hmm. but the fundamental one that was my problem, and I, I just tweeted it this morning. I just literally tweeted it this morning that said, the reason Jesus came to earth is because the law could not do what we needed That's to do. Okay. okay, and only Jesus could do it. Right, right. So right. substitution is right at the heart, uh -huh. and say a word about propitiation, and uh, meaning, was God angry at all human beings because of their sin and and wrath rested upon us and he loved us enough so that he would insert intrude his son between his own wrath and us so that he became a curse for us and and the wrath is diverted onto the son from us is, is what i've just described well you just you just said it perfectly last year uh, uh, in the seven weeks before Easter, I did the seven, seven last words of the cross. Okay, and I, I preached through that right up to Easter. And uh, the, the doctrine of propitiation, you cannot have Jesus saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, without understanding propitiation. Mm -hmm. The Bible says, uh, at, at that point, God looks down on his own son, and he says, son, you know I have said in Numbers, I will by no means clear the guilty, not even you. 
Not even you. Right. And, and, and so he took that wrath on him, uh, self, and at that moment, he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken yeah. me? And if you don't understand it, you don't understand how much God loves you. Amen. Let's go to prevenient grace, okay. the grace that uh, brings me to Christ mm -hmm. and that enables me to do what I need to do. Mm -hmm. Here is the one place where I found a sentence that Rick okay. Warren said that I stumbled over. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll I retract go. it. Let uh, me well, just say we'll, I retract we'll see. It right we'll now. see. I, I mean, it's it's. Um, so here's what I mean. Not, not everybody will understand where I'm coming from. Let me. Okay. You said on page 174, this is not the problem one. Sure. I'll get there in a minute. It is, it is the Holy Spirit's job to produce Christ-like character in you. Mm -hmm. Amen. That's mm -hmm. his, he, you're a monergist. You right. just said that. Right. You want to just, in two, two sentences, define it? No, go ahead. Okay. I mean, you, All you right, know never mind. Um, uh, we'll get there without defining it explicitly. The, the Bible says God is working in you, and you're quoting here Philippians 2, 13. Yeah, right. Uh, God is working in you, giving you the desire to obey Him mm -hmm. and the power. So when I read that, I thought, great, yeah. love that sentence. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. seems biblical to me. Yeah. Um, and then uh, you continue to, to speak carefully with the word through. At least mm -hmm. I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt sure, here. Sure. On page 174, you say, how does this happen in real life? Through the choices we make, and mm -hmm. I'm totally... A choice guy. I mean, okay. we do make choices, sure, sure. absolutely, and they matter, and something's happening through them. We choose to do the right thing in situations and then trust God's Spirit to give us His power, love, and faith mm -hmm. uh, and wisdom to do it. Now, at that point, I mean, ooh, what's coming first here? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. and how, how, first? how is this working? Now, here comes the sentence that I put a big no in. Okay. It. I mean, it's the only place I wrote a big <laughs> no, I think. I okay. had. Yeah. Um, the Holy Spirit releases His power uh -huh. the moment you take a step of faith. Obedience unlocks God's power. God waits for you to act first. Yeah, let me explain that. Yeah, I, I hear where you're going on that. I would not apply that to sanctification. I think that's a misapplication, and I probably should have clarified that better. Because what I'm saying there is I'm, I'm thinking of the children of Israel stepping into the Jordan. Mm -hmm, okay, mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. that wasn't their choices. God had told them to do it. Mm -hmm. So there's an obedience there. And it was only after they stepped in, the wave parted. And I think there have been many mm -hmm, examples mm -hmm, in my life mm -hmm. where God has asked me to risk, take a risk, and then he does the miracle. Okay. I would not apply that across the board okay. as a sanctification. Yeah. Not at all. Okay, that's really, really helpful. So yeah. let, me, let me restate what I heard in the first quote sure. and see if, if you, you mean it sure. the way I'm understanding it. Um, it says in Philippians 2, work out yeah. your own salvation with fear and trembling. Yeah. And then it gives this ground clause, for uh -huh. God is the Working. one who's working in you yeah. to will and to, do. And to work. So yeah. I'm concluding monergism in yeah. sanctification sure. to mean sure. that um, if I do choose to stop stealing things at the office mm -hmm. or to stop cheating on my tax report or yeah. to stop looking at pornography, my yeah. choices to do yeah. that have been prior enabled Absolutely. by the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I, well, I, as I believe, you don't have the power to make those good choices. Right. My, right. my, my decision-making power is broken. I, I believe this, okay? And this is why we, we teach this in, in our, what we call our Celebrate Recovery program, that willpower is, isn't going to work because your will's broken, mm -hmm. and, and I cannot choose... Uh, to uh, to to do the things that I want to do. That's Romans seven. So let, let's clarify that. Um, even after you are born again yeah. and have a new nature, yeah. you are dependent on the Holy Spirit to uh, awaken, prompt, enable the good that God calls us to do. Yes, I, I, I do believe that. But what I believe is I, I love the, the the phrase that Paul uses when he says, "Work out your salvation, for it is God who is working in." Mm -hmm. Now, there's a working out and a working in in the same verse. Okay. Now, what is work out? Well, notice he doesn't say work for. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's important. Yep. He's not saying work for either your salvation or your sanctification. Right. Okay. He says work out what God is working in. Right. The only way I can explain this is when I go to a gymnasium, when I work out, 
I'm not working to create muscle. I'm working, what I'm doing there is I'm working out the muscle God has already given me. Mm -hmm. If God hadn't given me the muscle, there's nothing to work out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. And, and, words, and more muscle grows, but muscle had to be there to get I, you started. I can grow the muscle mm -hmm. through some working out, but I can't create muscle. Muscle. Okay. The muscle initially came from God. Right. And so to me, the working out is not working for. Yeah, yeah. It, it is it, it's basically exercising what God gave you. Yeah, and, and the nerves came from God. Yeah, it and, all came and from the, God. And the explosive and the blood. synapses between them. <laughs> and, and, as that passage says, the desire to go to the gym. That's right. <laughs> now, implication for total depravity, all right. or whatever that is, yeah. depravity. Yeah. Um, would it would be right to infer from yeah. what you've said about the new birth that sure. you believe that our inability to awaken ourselves yeah. to faith and to begin this glorious purpose-driven life, yeah. it, it, we can't. We can't do it without God's sovereign... I, I just go back to Scripture, and that not of yourselves. Yeah. Uh, rest my case. Yeah. And that not of yourselves. Yeah. And that meaning faith. Uh, even the faith. Even the faith. Even the faith. Okay. And that not of yourselves. So total depravity uh, in that yes. way of saying it would mean totally unable to get my salvation started. Exactly. Okay. And I, I think I, that's... I totally believe that. It, 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 some people take total yeah. to mean you do as many bad things you could do. And clearly you could do more bad things as an unbeliever than you do do. But it, that, that's not the point. The you point know, is I I'm totally unable. Again, I don't use total depravity as much as I like to say total inability. Yeah, that, that's but, even more dev devastating. To I think. me, to me uh, it, it means, well, I used this as an illustration last week. We had Easter and we had uh, one of the miners who was here from uh, the Chilean mine. Yeah. Okay, okay. 33 men trapped for 69 days, 2,000 feet below the ground. Okay? Now, one of them was a Christian, and uh, over the next 69 days, 22 of those guys came to Christ. He came and shared his story. Uh, but the illustration that I used was, now the, uh, they, were, uh, they were unable to pay for their own salvation. Mm -hmm. Okay, they, for all intents and purposes, are dead and don't even know it. Mm -hmm. They're dead and don't know it. Mm -hmm. They're trapped, they're doomed, there's no way getting out. They can't say, well, really, I don't need the government because I've got a spoon. <laughs> and I'm going to dig my way out of this hole. It isn't going to happen. Now, on the other hand, coming this direction, they're coming down to save them. And the important thing that they need to understand is, no way would they ever be able to repay or afford it. This salvation, this rescue, is going to take tens of millions of dollars, and in 10 lifetimes, they could never afford or pay for their freedom, their salvation, their liberation, their redemption, their rescue, yeah. and whatever synonym. You've touched on hell already. Mm -hmm. um, let me read what you said and then just get you to say sure. yes to it or sure. whatever more you want to say. Sure. Page 27, while life on earth offers many choices, eternity offers only two, mm -hmm. heaven or hell. I like that. I should write that yeah, down. Yeah, you That's should. Good. It's well said. You say a lot of things well. <laughs> if you love and trust God's Son, mm -hmm. Jesus, mm -hmm. you will be invited to spend the rest of eternity with him. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, mm -hmm. if you reject his love, mm -hmm. forgiveness, and salvation, you will spend eternity apart from God. Right. Page 112. Why did God allow Jesus to endure ghastly mistreatment? so you could be spared from eternity in hell mm -hmm. and so share glory forever. Page 232, the Bible warns unbelievers he will pour out his anger and wrath on those who live for themselves. Uh, uh, and you put Romans 2.8. And one more, page 284, we must remember that no matter how contented or successful people appear to be without Christ, they are hopelessly lost and headed for eternal separation from God. So it just seems clear to me that this is a, a terrible thing you really do believe in because the Bible teaches it. And I would just ask, what's, what, in your mind, what's the nature of it? And, and here, I, I just want people who are hearing of this to yeah. know that this is one of the hardest and most painful things. We, we, we shouldn't, 
fight without crying. You yeah, know, I mean, there right. are people who are going to deny hell. They're right. doing that as right. we speak. Right. Um, but I, 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 there's so much lightweight criticism of the argument. I just mm -hmm. read it again yesterday mm -hmm. in some newspaper that were all over Trevin Wax because of huh. his particular comment. I thought. <laughs> So anyway, the, the atmosphere of this moment in this well, that conversation. Well, a stumbling block. There's no doubt about that. Yes. Yeah, so so what is it? What is hell? Well, I believe in a literal hell. Jesus believed in a literal hell. Jesus talked about flames of fire. I believe in that. But to me, hell is eternal separation from God. It's ultimate loneliness. This myth that people are going to see each other in hell, that they're going to party in hell, that, that's just, it is unloving to not tell the people the truth mm -hmm. when you know it's there. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we, we cannot wage on this, and I can say with a clear conscience that in all of the public interviews, every time I've been asked about hell, I, I shoot straight on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's real. Yes, it's re Jesus talked about it. People will go there. I was speaking at Aspen Institute one time, which is the brainiacs of the world. And a woman gets up and she says to me, I'm Jewish. I'm not going to accept Jesus as my Savior. Am I going to hell? Now, everything in my human nature wants to backpedal and make it safe and make it comfortable and say the politically correct thing. But I can't do that mm -hmm. because I fear God's disapproval more than I fear hers. Mm -hmm. And I also love her enough to tell her the truth. Mm -hmm. Now, so what did you say? Well, I'll tell you, the way I said it is a way that put, takes it off of me. Mm, because mm. It, it's tends, we often, when people bring up, the, and I would say this to pastors, don't make this your opinion versus their opinion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Lay it off on Jesus mm -hmm. every time. And so I said this. This is what I said to her. Everybody's betting their life on something. Okay? Atheists are betting there's no God. Buddhists are betting on Buddha. I'm betting my life that Jesus Christ was not a liar. That Jesus Christ was telling the truth. Jesus said, no one comes to the Father but by me. Now, I didn't say that. He said it. I am the way, not a good way, not the best way, not one of the ways, not a nice way. I am the way, mm -hmm. the truth, and the life. No one comes, I'm betting my life that he was telling the truth. Now, see what I did? Yeah. I took it off of me mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. making me the authority and, well, that's your word against mine. I right. said, wait a minute. Right. I'm just saying, I'm putting my trust that Jesus, yeah. Yeah. who split history into AD and BC, is not a liar. Yeah, that's good. Is it, is it conscious, the torment there conscious? Oh, I believe it is. And I believe it's eternal. Yeah. Can anybody get out? No. Once they're there? No, of course not. No. So you're, and, not, a, and, you're and, not a universalist? No, absolutely not a universalist. And I don't believe in purgatory, which obviously isn't in scripture. Yeah. Um, no, this is, the option is now, which is what motivates me to evangelism. Yeah. Yeah. People need to understand why do I go spend time with people I don't agree with? Why do I hang out with gays? Why do I hang out with atheists? Why do I hang out with crooked politicians? Uh, or, as would Jesus would, with prostitutes and tax collectors? I'm an evangelist, okay? And I am motivated by the fact that in the next 365 days, 136,000 Californians will die, mm -hmm. and most of them will go into an eternity without Christ. Mm -hmm. In the next 365 days, 2.4 million believe, Americans will die. Most of them will go into eternity without Christ. In the next 365 days, 74 million people in the world will, will go into eternity without Christ and without hope. I can't live with that. I can't. My love compels us mm -hmm. to it, care about that. The implication of what I hear you saying, yeah. which was on my next page, so you're yeah. tracking right with my, <laughs> my mind, is the eternal destiny of those who've never heard. Yeah. It, it, do you believe 
that there's another way for a person who's never heard of Jesus to be saved, or must he hear the gospel and believe it to be saved? Jesus made it really clear. Go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to do you know, all that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always. Time after time again, if you can be saved without Christ, missions is a crock. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're better off not to go. We're better off not to have a peace plan. And again, why am I doing the P, which is two P's, by the way. It's promote reconciliation and plant churches. Mm-hmm. We plant mm-hmm. churches mm-hmm. to promote reconciliation. We don't just promote reconciliation. No. These are the five things Jesus did. There's some things that Jesus did we can't do, like die for the sins of mankind and redemption of all through his precious blood. But Jesus did say, I've given you an example uh, now go and do likewise. And, and he, Jesus, planted a church. He equipped servant leaders. Okay, And what he did on there is he loved everybody. He fed the 5,000. He trained the 70. He discipled the 12. And he mentored three. Now, in, in, even in the 12, only Peter and James and John get to go in the Garden of Gethsemane. Only Peter, James, and John get to go on the Mount of Transfiguration. Only Peter, James, and John get to see Peter's mother-in-law healed. And in Galatians, Paul calls Peter, James, and John, it's a different James, the pillars of the church. Obviously, it worked mm-hmm. because, uh, you know, we're all here. Mm-hmm. Okay. So Jesus planted a church. He equipped leaders. He assisted the poor. The Bible says, you know, the first message, uh, in, in his first public recorded message is Luke 4. He's in his hometown. Now, he's already been ministering for a year. We always preach, and then go do it. Jesus did it for a year, and then announces his agenda. And his announced agenda is the Isaiah passage, and the very first thing he says, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's appointed me to preach good news to the poor. Does God love, have favorites? Yes, he does. He loves the poor. I believe that. I believe that 2,000 verses in, in the Bible talk about the poor, and God's saying, if you care about the poor, I will bless you. Mm-hmm. So he cares for the poor. He assists, He cares for the sick. And Jesus went into every village, it says he went preaching, teaching, and healing. Mm-hmm. I believe that Jesus' threefold ministry was preaching, which is evangelism and edification, teaching, which is education, and healing, which is, in, in our sense, health care. Mm-hmm. In other words, he cared about not just the spirit, but also the mind and the body. It is not by accident that the first school and the first hospital mm-hmm. in every, every nation in the world. It started by Christians because we have a preaching, teaching, and healing faith. Mm-hmm. And then he educated the next generation. Let the children come to me. They are the kingdom of God. If you want to do the kingdom of God, you must care about children's ministry, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Now, none of those things are going to bring in the millennium. Mm-hmm. I don't, I'm not kidding myself, but I'm using those as a bridge to do the eternity mm-hmm. issue. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The extent of the atonement is the most um, vexed right. of the doctrines. You and I have talked about this. It's the one I have the most problem with in, in the typical tulip. Yeah, yeah, of the doctrines of grace. So yeah. uh, let me read something you wrote. Um, and there's two ways to take what you wrote. Mm-hmm. I could take it in my way, mm-hmm. but I doubt if it's your way. I wonder. <laughs> okay. I, I, frankly, I think, I, I've said to various people who stumble over this so-called fourth point, Yeah. I said, if you give me 15 minutes, we can agree. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but let's try it. It won't take 15 minutes. Okay. You said, if you want to be used by God, this is page 288. Yes. You must care about what God cares about. What he cares about most is the redemption of the people he made. He wants his lost children found. Yeah. Interesting phrase. He wants yeah. his lost children found, which could mean everybody on the planet, uh-huh. or he could mean... Uh, John eleven fifty two, where Caiaphas says, "Better that one die for the nation." For the and, nation, and right. then and then John says right. he was speaking by prophecy that he would die, that he might gather into one the children of God who mm-hmm. are scattered abroad. Mm-hmm. Um, then you say nothing matters more to God than <laughs> than and then the cross. Now, my, if, if I were to take that my way and interpret it in the light of John eleven fifty two, mm-hmm. Christ died to gather into one the children of God scattered around, the sheep that are scattered out there, the, the elect. Yeah. And so in that sense, the death of Christ has a divine purposefulness. Mm. 
that it really did achieve mm -hmm. the faith and the ingathering of mm -hmm. the sheep. Mm -hmm. And I think I could say that. That would be called particular redemption sure. or sure. limited atonement. Sure. Without denying mm -hmm. that the cross makes possible and purchases a bona fide offer for every person on the planet mm -hmm. so that you can look a mm -hmm. person right in the face. Well, we're a lot closer than I thought we were. And say... Yeah. You could even say, yeah. and I could quote John Murray on this. He's yeah. vintage, vintage, vintage yeah, exactly. reform. Right. John, and say, Christ died mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. Meaning not mm -hmm. that he effectively accomplished your propitiation, Got it. but that he died Got such that his arms are extended to you saying, if you will come, if you will come, it's it. yours. This is yours. Got it. Got it. So I feel like I can talk like the... Uh, atonement is there beckoning everyone while believing the new, when Jesus said this cup is the new covenant. Right, right. Well, the new covenant is when he writes the law in my heart mm -hmm. and draws me to himself and puts the fear of God mm -hmm. in me. I think he bought my conversion, mm -hmm. which means he didn't do that for everybody. Mm -hmm. So there are designs in the cross that are for his elect. But there are also designs in the cross that are for everybody. So there's, my, there's John Piper's effort to... Well, that, you know, we're a lot closer than I thought we were on that one. Because I, I do believe, again, this goes back to my hermeneutic of when I have two different passages, I believe them both. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I believe Ephesians 5. Christ died for the church and gave his life for her. I believe that with all my heart. Mm -hmm. I also believe Peter... God is not willing that any should perish. Mm -hmm. I think he wants people to be saved. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I believe in John 3.16. So, I, 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 uh, do, what do you say? Who does Christ die for? He died for the, died for the church. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't think God's death on the cross through Christ was a failure, if you're, if you're saying mm -hmm. that. I do mm -hmm. not believe that anybody he intended to die for is, is failing in, in that area. Is going to hell. Absolutely not. No. But I, I, on the other hand, I, I don't believe in universalism either, mm -hmm. that his salvation automatically mm -hmm. assumes mm -hmm. everybody's going to be there, which some people have interpreted the Romans passage of as Adam, in Adam all died, in Christ yeah. all should be yeah. made. I don't interpret that in a universalist way. Mm -hmm. I, I like the way you say it, John. I'd like to hear more about it. Well... <laughs> we'll talk. We'll talk again. Right. Uh, implications for the world. We're almost done. Okay. Implications for the world of of your strong view on holiness, yeah. um, which I like. Mm -hmm. Page two fourteen. You won't be able to say no to the devil mm -hmm. unless you have said yes to Christ. Mm -hmm. Now. Mm -hmm. You love the world and you speak to the world as much as you speak to believers. Mm -hmm. Does that mm -hmm. imply? the world, that is, the non-believer, is always doing the bidding of the devil. Of course they are. Yeah. In other, in other, uh, uh, what I believe is my righteousness are as filthy rags. Mm. My, my goodness is not good enough. Mm. Mm. Uh, and, and in fact, I preached on this on Easter, and I talked about, I said, you know, here in Southern California, uh, everybody thinks they've got the good life. And the good life means looking good, feeling good, and having the goods. I said, there's one problem with the good life. It's not good enough. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's not good enough. My righteousness are as filthy rags. And, and you know, yeah, if you want to judge yourself by Hitler, sure, you're better than Hitler. In fact, if you want to judge yourself by me, sure, you're probably better than me. But uh, we've all fallen short of the glory of God, which is a perfect standard. And the issue is not... Are you better than so? I have no doubt you're probably better than me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it's like we're all swimming to, uh, to Hawaii, and some people <laughs> swim a mile and five, but nobody's going to make it to Hawaii. Yeah. You know, yeah. So it isn't going to happen. Rick, underneath everything we've been talking about as we draw towards an end is the Bible. Amen. And uh, here's, here, here's some quotes okay. from The Purpose Driven Life. Page 90. You can't love God unless you know Him, and you can't know Him without knowing His Word. Mm -hmm. The Bible says God revealed Himself to Samuel through His Word. I, lo I love that First Samuel three twenty. It's just passage? formative of the way I think yeah. about knowing God. Yeah. 
God still uses that method today. Page 101, worship must be based on the truth of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Page 186, to be healthy disciple of Jesus, feeding on God's Word must be your first priority. Mm -hmm. Page 188, we can't watch television for three hours and then read the Bible for three minutes and expect to grow. Mm -hmm. Page 215, if you don't have any Bible verses memorized, you've got no bullets in your gun. Yeah. Um, how do you describe your understanding of its authority and truthfulness? What words do you like to use? Well, it's first place, it's inerrant. I believe the scripture is without error in its original autographs. Uh, as I tweeted the other day, I don't believe my interpretation's inerrant. Right. I don't believe anybody else's interpretation is inerrant. Mm -hmm. But I do believe the scripture is inerrant. I, I believe in the plenary verbal plenary interpret, uh, uh, inspiration of Scripture, without a doubt. I come from classic uh, Baptist background, which, which holds a high view of Scripture. Mm -hmm. uh, but more than that, uh, I have tried for 32 years to teach people to be self-feeders, mm -hmm. not just simply to listen to the Word of God. I don't think that's enough. I think many times pastors uh, are feeding them good word, but they're not teaching them to be self-feeders. It's interesting, the very first book I wrote, I wrote in college uh, 35 years ago, and it was a book on 12 Bible study methods on how to study scripture. Um, uh, one of the verses that, that dominates Saddleback for, uh, for 31 years is Hosea 4.6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. However, knowledge is not enough. And I think I've shared this with you before. I actually believe that there are levels of Scripture, I mean levels of, of understanding of Scripture, mm -hmm. that we start with knowledge, which is knowing the what of Scripture. But then we must move to perspective, which is knowing the why. Okay. Now, the Bible says about Moses, it says, it says in Psalms, the people of Israel knew the acts of God, but Moses knew the ways of God. I differentiate that between knowledge and perspective. Knowledge is knowing the content of Scripture. Mm -hmm. Who is Jacob? Okay. What is the doctrine of hell, heaven, and everything else? That's the knowing the what. Most people don't know that Saddleback has a 72-week systematic theology course that is required for every small group member and every staff member, and I've had over 15,000 people go through this 72-week small uh, systematic study, I would take the doctrinal knowledge of any 500 Saddleback members and compare it to any 500 members of any other church, and we'd beat them. No, I've heard I you have, say that. I, I, would, I, would, I have no fear in that. We're probably one of the few churches in America that memorizes a Bible verse every week. Mm -hmm. Okay, it was Lamentation 324. And so teaching, hearing, reading, studying, memorizing, meditating, but then the fundamental thing that we do at this church is be doers of the word, not hearers only. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I had a guy ask me one time, he said, what's the best translation? He goes, do I, do I need a living Bible? And I said, you ought to be a living Bible. I said, you're either a Bible or a libel. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah. so the scripture is the only authority for our lives. Mm -hmm. It's not scripture plus anything else. Yeah. And it is, it, is, uh, uh, it, it is our guidebook for all rule and practice. Yeah. One of the difference between, I think, between yeah. you and me, although yeah. I don't, I don't listen to you every Sunday, yeah. and you don't listen to me every Sunday, is that um, in my expositional approach, yeah. I tend to have a passion for wanting to people to see how I got what I got. Hmm. I don't get that you're driven by that same passion. Okay. Uh, not on the Sunday morning services. Mm -hmm. uh, on midweek that we did for many years, and of course now, what most people don't know is that we have more people in Bible study than we have on the weekends. Mm -hmm. I, I told you this. We have 32,000 people in our small groups studying Scripture, uh, and we often do book-by-book -book studies, but 22,000 on the weekend. Um, what I'm interested in, when somebody comes on Sunday morning, mm -hmm. see, I believe worship can be a witness. I don't mm -hmm. think you have to water it down, mm -hmm. but I do think mm -hmm. you have to be clear. And I see Sunday morning sometimes like a, a, um, uh, like a uh, emergency room. Somebody's coming in, and he's bleeding to death. His wife has left him. His kids are on drugs. He's lost his thing. And I'm going, okay, I've got to first get the word to him that relates to him at that point. And then he goes, wow, that helped. What else you got in that book? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, let me just say this. I do think that God doesn't care how you deal with the text as long as you get to the text. Mm -hmm. And I think 
it is a misnomer to say exposition is only book by book. I mm-hmm, think there's mm-hmm, verse sure. by verse and verse with verse. Right, right. There's some things, like if you're going to teach on abortion, you can't just take one text. Mm-hmm. You have to take multiple texts, but you have to expose, expose yeah, the text exactly. while you're there. Totally, totally agree with that. We're, let's, let's wrap it up within five minutes. Um, and I've got two more things. Um, and this is almost the same as what we've been talking about, doctrinal depth. You sure. say worship... Page 102, worship must be both accurate right. and authentic. Right. God-pleasing worship is deeply emotional and deeply doctrinal. Do- doctrinal. That's right. And 140, 146, uh, many church fellowships and small groups remain superficial because they are afraid of conflict. Mm-hmm. So um, you're committed to deepening doctrine and not being afraid of of conflict. Not at all. But yeah. Sunday morning mm-hmm. is not tend to where you see that, the deepening of, of doctrine. Sunday morning, is, it, a lot of people think it's not deep because I don't use theological terms. Hmm. I once taught a 12-week series on um, sanctification hmm. without ever using the word. I taught an eight-week series on the incarnation without ever using the word. Mm. Uh, I did a 12-week series on grace. Obviously, grace was an easy word to use. Mm. But I, I, uh, when I did the names of God, you can use the names of God without having to dig into, you know, explain now. Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkenu, Jehovah Rapha. Uh, l- let's explain all these terms. So what I like to do is I've said I like to teach theology without pe- telling people it's theology and without using theological terms. Mm-hmm. So, I, but I, here's my question. What creates deep preaching? Mm-hmm. That is, that's my question. What yeah, is deep preaching? And I would say it's not deep until it gets to the heart and the character of the person. Mm-hmm. That I could teach through revelation. Including God. Including God. That's what I'm talking about. If you get to the heart and nature of God, mm-hmm. you get to the heart and nature of God, I could teach through Revelation and explain all of the meaning of everything and not be deep. Mm -hmm. Today, a lot of people equate deep preaching, meaning I explain the background. Mm. Well, that's not deep at all. Mm. Deep is Mm life-transforming. Simple does not mean shallow. Mm. Simple does not mean simplistic. Simple does not mean, uh, you know, it, it's, it's lightweight. Simple means it's clear. Paul says, I'm afraid you've complicated the gospel. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid that you, you get away from the simplicity of the gospel. Mm-hmm. And actually, we, you can, it's easy to complicate the gospel, and it's easy to confuse people. And I could, pre- you know, I've got a doctorate, mm-hmm. and I could easily preach in a way people walk in and go, whew, boy, that was deep. Well, I wasn't deep, it was just muddy. Yeah, confusing. Okay. Here's the difference between simple and simplistic. Simple is, this is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad. Simplistic is, have a nice day. There's deep theological truth behind this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. Simplistic is, have a nice day. I have one more thing I want to say. Sure. But I want to make sure before we go away that you were hoping I would go somewhere I didn't go. Anything just kind of burning to to get out that you say, um, oh, I thought he was going to ask this, and I didn't get a chance to say it about no. the purpose-driven life or about doctrine or about anything. No. Okay. This is good. I'm having fun. Yeah, yeah me too. We can go on for another couple yeah, hours. But we won't. I've got to get on a plane. <laughs> and and he, t- Page 214, last quote. Um, th- oh, this is from the biography okay. that you said you haven't read. I've never read it. <laughs> That's okay. Never read it. Um, a former staffer says, mm-hmm. Rick had really sensed a sacred trust, a sense of stewardship of life. Mm -hmm. I wrote amen right there. Mm -hmm. Um, You are the probably, Mm -hmm. and uh, I I would like to pray for your humility because you you, you are challenged more than anybody perhaps, but we all struggle, but you're you're the most publicly influential pastor in the world perhaps. You've written a book that has sold, I suppose, as a non-fiction hardback yeah. more than any other book in history outside the Bible, something yeah. like that anyway. It's a good seller. That's an incredible trust. That's an incredibly sacred 
trust. And I want to end with, a, with an exhortation and a prayer mm. uh, for those who are, are watching this. My mm. prayer, Rick, uh, and, and exhortation is that with, with your place in history, in American church, in the global church, fix. It's mm. just fix. It's mm. just you don't need to do any more. Mm -hmm. Everybody knows what's up here and, and how God is, I believe God, mm has blessed Saddleback and God has blessed uh, a purpose-driven mm. life. Uh, with that firmly fixed, my plea is that according to what you just said, you, you take the next 20 years and mm. really gather these hundreds of thousands of pastors who mm. look your way and, and press them down deep. Mm. Press them into doctrine mm. and press them into the mm. word, word and into the deep glories of God, leave a legacy, mm. uh, not just of breadth and not mm -hmm. just of global mm -hmm. uh, impact mm -hmm. now, mm -hmm. but, but leave a legacy of, of depth that mm. will last for generations and centuries. Mm. I love you. I love you too. I admire you. you. I'm glad you're my friend. And uh, there will be hard days mm. yet to come. You, 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 you have hard days now. We've you know my hard days, yeah. We, we both know uh, yeah. what people don't know yeah. about each of each other's hard mm -hmm. days. And I would like to just simply uh, strengthen your hand and encourage your heart and underline the beauties of the truths that we've spent the last hour and a half talking about. Well, I, I, I'm deeply touched by what you just said, John. I, I mean, I really am. I'm not just making this up. I, I believe there are two great themes in Scripture, salvation and stewardship. You know, I believe that one day we'll stand before the Lord, and he's going to ask a couple questions. The first one is, what did you do with my son Jesus? That's it. What did you do with my son Jesus? And the second one, that's the question of salvation. The second one is the question of stewardship which is, what did you do with what I gave you? I didn't ask for this notoriety. And actually, it's, it's been, it scared me to death. It's quite a pain. And when the book became uh, uh, the big hit that it was, it brought an enormous amount of attention and an enormous amount of money. And both of them scared me. Because I didn't want to be a celebrity. I, I, when I started Saddleback, I said, I'm never going on the radio or television. I wasn't going to put my services, because I didn't want to be a celebrity. I, I just, I think always being in the spotlight blinds you. And I know enough about my own heart, that the, uh, the temptations. And, I, and uh, I am grateful, honestly, for the thorns in the flesh that, many people don't know about, that actually forced me to, to be dependent upon God. Uh, and, and that's part of that sovereign pain. Yeah. Okay? The, the, the part of the limp is God, God if he's going to strengthen you, then he's going to also touch your hips so you walk with a limp the rest of your life. And, mm -hmm. and I've got limps, and I've talked to you about them, and I've told others about them too. And uh, when I began to pray, I said, Lord, Show me what to do with the money and show me what to do with the fame. And God taught me what I call the stewardship of affluence and the stewardship of influence. He gave me two passages, the one in Corinthians and the one in Psalm 72. The one in Corinthians is the passage where he says, uh, those who teach the gospel should make a living by the gospel. But, Paul says, I will not accept that right because mm -hmm. I want to serve the gospel for free, so I'm a slave to no man. And, and most people, it's pretty widely known now that, that Kay and I, uh, when literally tens of millions of dollars came in. You write this book. I could have bought an, uh, an island and retired and had people serve me little glasses of iced tea with umbrellas. But when you write a book and the first sentence is, it's not about you, then you know the money's not for you. I had no idea how often I was going to be tested by that sentence. Yeah. I'm often tested nine or ten times a day. And I'll walk into a room and I'll go, it's not about you. And I'll get praised, and I'll say, it's not about you. And I'll get criticized, yeah. and I'll say, it's not about you. And I, 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 have, I never knew how much I was going to be tested mm -hmm. on that thing. And, and I'm begging the people who watch this, please pray for me. I would rather stick a knife in my heart than dishonor the name of God. Amen. So you formed a foundation. Yeah, we did, we did two things. Short. We, okay. 
Number one, we decided we're not changing our lifestyle one bit. I still live in the same house I've lived in for 19 years. I drive an 11-year-old Ford. I wear a watch that I paid for 17 bucks for at Walmart. Okay, I could have bought a thousand Bentleys, mm -hmm. but we, we, we I, I, I live, you know, I don't, I've saved thousands by not wearing socks. Uh, we, we, I stopped taking a salary eight years ago. Uh, we added up all the church had paid me in 25 years and I gave it back and we became reverse tithers. We started this 35 years ago, raising our tithe by 1% a year at least. Now we never told anybody for 30 years. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in some years when we got a rig pay raise, I'd raise our scythe 4 or 5%. And years we were, we were financially short, we raised it a half a percent. Today, we raised it another percent this last year. We give away 91, and we live on, 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 on 9. Now, that was actually the easy part, mm -hmm. just give away the money. And, and that's a whole lot of fun. I, I don't really have big needs. If i got a good pair of jeans and a T-shirt, I'm, I'm fine. So that was the easy part. The hard part was, what do I do with this attention? Mm -hmm. Okay, the money actually was pretty easy, and 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 you know the, the money, sex, and power. You know, lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. I haven't had a problem, thank God. And the Bible says, "Let him who stands take heed lest he fall," with sexual lust or immature uh, or things like that, because I set parameters around my life like mm -hmm. Billy Graham did 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. I've never been in a room with a woman who's not my wife ever alone in 31 years. Mm -hmm. Never. Well, I don't even get in a hotel, in a in an um, in a uh, uh, elevator with my secretary. They know this. People know this. If I'm driving down the street and I see a member who's a woman on a on a uh, with a car uh, problem, I don't stop. I call and I say I send somebody else. I want people say that's going overboard. I'd rather go overboard than be thrown overboard. <laughs> so the problem was has not been money and the problem has not been uh, sex, but the the pride issue is so subtle. Yeah. And, and even when you don't know it. So the, the other issue was the issue of, of affluence, I mean influence. Psalm 72 sounds like the most selfish prayer ever prayed. It's uh, Solomon's prayer for more influence. Mm -hmm. And when you pray this prayer, it sounds more selfish than Jabez's prayer. Mm -hmm. He says, God, I want you to make me famous. I want you to spread the fame of my name to many lands. I want you to give me power. I want other kings to know who I am. Until you read the reason, he says, so that the king may support the widow and orphan, defend the defenseless, speak up for the oppressed. He talks about all the marginalized of society, yeah. the immigrant. And out of that, it said the purpose of influence is to speak up for those who have no influence. And so I've really spent the last decade overseas. Mm -hmm. I tried to get out of America in many ways mm -hmm. to spend times in the villages where they didn't know me. But I covet your prayers because this thing could take me down, and I'm very aware of it. Let's pray. Father in heaven, that's a good place to stop. And I ask now for me and for Rick Warren mm. in particular that you would protect us from oh, the lust of the flesh, lust yes. of the eyes, and the, this pride in possessions. Amen. And that the the celebrity thing, the mm -hmm. influence thing, mm -hmm. would not have a light that blinds our eyes. Amen. Oh, that Christ would be our light. Amen. In his light do we see light. Amen. So guard Rick from pride and, and grant that the glories of the truth that we have just celebrated and mm -hmm. articulated mm -hmm. would continue to, to inform everything we preach, everything mm -hmm. we do. We long that Christ would be exalted mm -hmm. and that the mission would go forward and that millions of people would pass from death to life mm -hmm. and that underneath all the efforts would be your holy word mm -hmm. and your holy scriptures and above all things would be your glory shining bright as the point of the universe. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you.